one, and we're live. Hello world, it's Siraj, and welcome to this live game show where one person is gonna win $500 in cash by answering some natural language processing questions. In this episode, we're going to build a language translator together using existing libraries like San, uh, it's, co it's called Sandtran, uh, I-N-L-T-K, Keras, and a few other ones like Pi Sanskrit. Now, this is a really important topic for me in particular because language models, I feel, are going to help us get to artificial general intelligence. And I've got a lot of examples to show you in this video, but I wanna start off with this demo. And I'm gonna show you the demo, and then I'm, we're gonna go through some math, some code. I'm just gonna throw a bunch of natural language processing information at you. And your job is to pay attention so that you can answer my questions accurately because one person who answers all three questions is going to win the game, all right? So let's start with the demo first. In the demo, we have some Python because I love Python. And in this demo, I'm going to show you uh, this process of translating Sanskrit to English. And so basically, this was a library called Sandtran that I reformatted for Colab. And this is basically gonna show us a great example of translating Sanskrit to English. And Sanskrit is a 6,000 year old language um, that there's actually not much data. And we're gonna talk about that problem right now. There is not much data, Sanskrit data on the web. And so finding that data is gonna be really difficult. But basically you can see here that if I hit compile, what it's going to do is it's going to, let me make that bigger. What it's going to do is it's going to uh, take that initial English translation and it's going to translate it to Sanskrit. So because it's the Bible, it's going to have some Bible text here. And then underneath, let me make sure that this is visible. You're gonna be able to see it in Sanskrit. So that's the basic idea here of just translating uh, English to Sanskrit and then vice versa. All right, so I wanna see if this is even visible. I, I don't think this is actually visible. Let me make sure this is visible. So hold on, I wanna make sure this is visible. Okay, now it's visible. <laughs> It wasn't visible before. All right, so this is the example at the very, very bottom. Uh, and so what happened here was this was just a pre-trained uh, Keras model that uh, was trained on this Bible text data. And as you can see here, you have this sentence from the Bible in English, okay? And then you have the Sanskrit translation. Now, you know, Jupyter Notebook isn't good at, trans at printing out Sanskrit characters. So, you know, I, I added some right here at the very end to give you a taste of it. But this is Sanskrit. It's just not in a properly formatted form. And we're going to talk about some of those problems in a second, all right? So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to talk about all the different libraries we can use to translate from Sanskrit to English. We're going to talk about language models. We, we have a lot to talk about. But before we start, I just want to say that, you know, natural language processing was always my favorite subtopic of machine learning. And I remember my at my alma mater, Columbia University, that I dropped out of, um, my favorite professor was the natural language processing professor at the time, Michael Collins, who, ironically enough, whose course notes I'll, I'll be using for this video. But I remember going back to Columbia very recently, like two years ago, and meeting Michael and being like, hey, you know, you were such a huge inspiration to me. Uh, what do you think about deep learning? And he was like, what's that? And that just stunned me because he was this guy that I, you know, really admired, you know, with this PhD who'd been doing this for decades, who had no idea what deep learning was. And that's significant because deep learning basically replaced a huge chunk of his domain knowledge in natural language processing. And let's talk about what that means. But, you know, some of those ideas are timeless, you know, in Michael's original natural language processing class. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. What are the timeless ideas? What, what doesn't get old? And, you know, that is something that is really important. And that's something that we're going to have to talk about uh, in this video, right? So what are the timeless parts of natural language processing that will always be relevant that, you know, doesn't matter what the next, uh, you know, hot technique is. It's, it's always going to be relevant. So let's talk about that. All right. So I'm going to write that out with this math cam. Something that I really want to talk about today are language models and why language models are so beneficial. So assume we have a sentence. Hello world. It's Siraj. I just misspelled my own name. 
So hello world, it's Siraj, okay? So this is our text corpus. We have four, four words, four strings in our text corpus, our training data. This is our training data, and this is our testing data, just four words. Now, what we wanna do is we want to capture this language's knowledge, like what is contained in this, in this data. Now, how do we do that? Well, one way to do that is to build a language model. And essentially, one rough way we can think about language models is that they are models that help us predict the next likely word in a sentence. So how would we write that in this case? Well, one simple thing we could do is we could say, well, this is these are four words, right? We have X1, we have X2, we have X3, and X4, right? So we have variables for all of these words. Now, how do we write this out as a language model? Well, here's what we're going to do with these four words. We're going to say that if we want to predict the probability, if we want to say the probability of a given word X, you know, it could be up to the N, X I up to the N, what is that probability going to look like? Well, that probability is going to look like this. Oh my God. All right. We don't want to have things fall over, do we? Okay. This is how you know it's live. What we want to do is we want to say that this probability is going to be equal to the number of times our sentence in question shows up. So how many times? So C of, you know, whatever it is, X of N, X, you know, X3, whichever X it is. No, we're going to count how many times that shows up divided by the total number of words or sentences in a document, like whatever level that we're at. Now, now, this is a very basic language model right here. All we're saying with this language model right here, this language model right here, all we're saying is that the probability of a given word is gonna be equal to the number of times that word shows up divided by the total number of words in a sentence. Now, this is a terrible language model, and why? Think about it, why is this terrible? Just think about that for a second. This is a terrible language model because it's going to give a probability of zero to any word that it doesn't find in the initial training data set. So, you know, this is going to work for any of the words like it's going to be able to predict, you know, it's one, one count of it's one count of all of these. So it's going to give all these a probability that is non-zero. But what if we gave it a word like, you know, John or Tim or something like that? It's not going to know. It's going to give it a zero. So what we need is a more generalizable language model. And how do we do that? How do we improve that language model so that it's generalizable? And let me show you exactly how we're going to do that. In order to improve that language model so that it's generalizable, we're going to have to use something that's called the Markov property. And I want you to think about what that could mean. Like, what does the Markov property mean? And why is it relevant in this context? Well, let me tell you why it's relevant. The Markov property states that if we have, <clears throat> if we have a set of words, so, you know, hello world, it's Siraj. We're gonna think about this as a set of states. So each of these, you know, H, W, I, S, single letters to uh, represent each of the words. There is, you know, a word is actually a sequence, right? It's a sequence of words. And, you know, one way to think about a set of words is as a sequence. And if there is a sequence, then this, these are not just words. They are a set of states, states in a sequence. And if there are a set of states, then there's a transition probability between states. Okay, and so there's a transition probability between these states of words. And what the Markov property says is that uh, a state depends on all of its previous states. So S actually depends on the, the words or the nodes that came before it. And so that's the Markov property. And this then becomes a Markov chain because we have a set of states and then we have a transition probability between those states. And so one, and so why am I talking about this? Why am I showing you the Markov property? Well, the Markov property is important because it allows us to change our language model. It allows us to update our language model so that it's going to not give a probability of zero to words that were seen outside of its uh, training distribution. So what does that look like? What is a, what is a transition, what is a Markov property based language model look like. And now I'm going to write that for you. So what that looks like is this same deal where we have the probability of a given word, you know, up to N, doesn't matter what word is, is going to be equal to the probability of a given word given 
the previous two words. So if this is x of i, the previous two is gonna be x of i minus one and then x of i minus two. It's kind of hard to see that, but these are the previous two. So the probability of a given word is going to be the probability of a word given the previous two world, words. And what do we do to those probabilities? Well, we, we, we multiply them together using this uh, product um, symbol right here, which is gonna say, it's gonna be the product of these probabilities. So the probability of a given word is gonna be equal to the product of the previous two probabilities. And what this is, is a trigram language model. So basically, it's using the Markov property to say a probability is dependent on the previous two states. And that is the Markov property, and it allows us to define a trigram language model. So each word is dependent on the previous two words. So there's a pair of three words, trigram, right? And so what happens, and so what Michael Collins used to talk about and what he used to teach us is that, you know, if you build this trigram language model, you can iterate through your input corpus text and you can create probabilities for all of these words. So you can create a set of trigrams, right? So then, you know, once you have the set of trigram probabilities and you've built this language model, then you can iterate through your text corpus and then predict all of those trigram probabilities. But what if you don't see a set of trigrams, right? Again, you have that same problem of what if, you know, your, your data that you're inferencing on, it's not in the training data set. So again, you have a problem. It's, it's less of a problem um, because you have more generalizability using the Markov property, but it's still a problem. So how do we fix that? And so that's what I want to talk about. All right. So how we fix that is the key to this video. And it's the key to all of these giant language models that have been uh, created in the past few years. Now, before we talk about that, I want to make sure that you've been listening to me as I've been uh, talking about language models. So I'm going to ask you a question about language models based on what I just talked about. All right. And the question is, I want you to go to itempool.com slash LL source LL uh, slash live. And I want you to answer this question. I will now begin accepting uh, answers. Okay. So this is a math input question. Now, whether you're watching this recorded or live, I want you to think about this very deeply. If a trigram is defined as the probability of a given word, given the previous two words, so the one word is, uh, you know, WI given WI minus two WI minus one, what's a bigram? So we did not talk about a bigram, but we talked about a trigram. So I want you to think about this. How do you define that? And use the math not notation that this uh, uh, allows you to do to have that underscore, right? Okay, it's very simple. Like if probability of WI depends on the previous two, that's a trigram, that's three. What is a bigram? Think about the root of that word, tri versus bi. And while you answer that question, I'm going to answer some questions from the audience. So the first question is, um, is the Keras model an LSTM based model? Uh, the translation is a se series to series prediction. Um, uh, it is an encoder decoder model it is a transformer and it is a sequence to sequence model. You can build this with Keras. We're going to go through a whole bunch of models in a second. Um, and I want to see, you know, what you think of all of these different models. But as we wait for some of these answers to come in, we want to think about what is a bigram versus a trigram model. And, you know, just to give you a, a quick hint here, uh, a bigram is going to depend on just the previous word, not the previous two. Trigrams are dependent on the previous two, but by it's only previous on the previous word. So I want you to think about that one as we, as I answer one more uh, question. Um, yeah, okay, we got our first submission, good. So go ahead and keep submitting. I wanted to make sure that that was a, a thing. Imagine an AI that can decipher any language. Yes, that would be amazing. That's actually the goal of this video. Um, you know, what is an AI that can decipher any language look like? And if you look at GPT-3, in a lot of ways, it's an oracle. It is an, this amazing text generation engine that you can talk to, you can get ideas from. It can ask, act as a creative partner, as a partner in discovery. Um, it's really good at transfer learning. So if you give it, you know, some sort of, very difficult domain knowledge. It's going to be able to, uh, you know, interpret that data, you know, much better than you're used to. And I want to make sure that everybody is 
getting this question. So this is a harder question. We only have two people who got this one. And so I might've done this a little too hard, but uh, we will just wait 30 more seconds and then we're gonna keep going. Let me answer one more question. The question is, what do you think about Rust? Rust is a very popular programming language on Hacker News. It will only get more popular in the coming years. And uh, so I, I think it's gonna be super useful. Um, I think it's gonna be useful for game development, as weird as that sounds. Rust is gonna be great for game development because not for graphics and stuff, but for what's happening on the back end. There's this recent game library that came out in Rust that was super popular on Hacker News. Uh, that's why I'm mentioning that, all right? So, wow, not many people answered. Uh, this qu one more qu question I'm gonna answer and then we're gonna keep going. How can I build a waste management app with AI or any other way? So what does a waste management API look like? If we're talking about, um, you know, what is the data stream that we're building? You know, it's always starts with the data. What is the data that we're starting with? Um, you know, what is a waste management API? You know, what is a waste management app that uses AI look like? Well, how do you efficiently sort uh, waste given some set of constraints? So what are the parameters of this model? What are the constraints here? You know, maybe it's a Markov decision process. process. If, it's a, if, if it's a real time data stream, Maybe, you know, you pipe it in with reinforcement learning and you define a policy that will optimize an, a certain allocation of resources. So that's what I'm kind of imagining. Efficient resource allocation optimized using gradient descent. Probably a great keyword to search for in terms of papers. Okay, now we have some actual answers. So I'm going to reveal um, the answer now. Here we go. In three, two, one, reveal. All right, one of them was pretty close. The answer was the probability of W given the previous, WI minus one. Um, one of them was pretty close. We're gonna keep going here. Um, there will always be a winner, all right? So don't worry, even if, I'll, I will pick a winner somehow. Okay, so don't worry, someone's always gonna win. All right, don't wanna make it too hard. So good job guys for, for the effort there. We're gonna keep going, all right? Okay, so now what are we gonna do next? So we talked about that. Now what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about Sanskrit. Like what are we, what are we gonna do with Sanskrit? Um, but before we do Sanskrit, I want to show you a single image that really matters to me. Um, we're, we're gonna talk about natural language processing. We're gonna talk about language models. So language models. Language models are super useful for a bunch of downstream language tasks, machine translation, natural language generation, text classification, text summarization. All of these things are useful um, applications of language models. And, you know, this trigram bigram mentality that Michael Collins had at Columbia uh, was, you know, just one way of doing things. But what happened with deep learning was, something totally different, which made everything that Michael Collins talked about irrelevant, mostly irrelevant. And what happened was this, essentially this giant chart. And basically this giant chart shows a bunch of language models over the past two years. And basically the X axis is time and the Y axis are the number of parameters or the size of the model. And so as you can see in the past two years, these models got really, really big. So that means they were trained on a lot of language data. And at the very, very tip, top of this, you see Microsoft's Turing NLG. That was a 17 billion parameter model, which is way bigger than the rest. Now, the reason I showed you this graph is just so that I can show you one more graph. Now, remember, keep in mind how much bigger Microsoft's model is compared to the other models. Now, on this chart, much more recent, you see Microsoft's Turing NLG right there, second to first place. With the first place goes to GPT-3 in terms of size. So you had 17 billion parameters versus 175 billion parameters. Okay, and so this was way, way, way bigger, and it was also much more accurate at all of those natural language tasks that we talked about, all of those downstream tasks. And so what that means and what that proves is that there is no upper bound on deep learning applied to natural language processing. These transformer networks, the more data you give them, the better they're gonna get. I keep saying this every week, but it's that important. Okay, it's that important. And what is the best learning resource for you to you know, learn about the advancements in this field? Well, I've got one perfect for you that I, that I just, you know, we, it's in the video description, but it's not enough to put it in the video description. I want to uh, show you 
live as well. And so it's Hugging Face. So Hugging Face is this, you know, they, they basically completely dominated the NLP space the past few years uh, in terms of documentation. And of course, they've got 36,000 stars on GitHub. But uh, more than that, the, the most important part of Hugging Face's uh, documentation are their collection of models that they have right here. They have, look at all of these uh, transformer models. And so the idea is that eventually all of this pre-processing like trigrams and bigrams and all this stuff, it didn't matter as much for deep learning because deep learning is basically just, you just throw the data in and it will figure out all of the structure, the logic necessary to structure and compress that data's dimensionality as, as efficiently as possible. And so th that's what transformers were trained on a lot of data. And you can see for all of these variations of transformer architectures, they've got everything. They've got the overview. They've even got the 10 line code snippet for it. Look at that. You know, you want to implement BERT, here's 10 lines in Python. And then they've got, you know, what all the parameters mean. So this, I just want to briefly show you this. This is the best NLP resource I have ever seen. Um, and it's definitely something that people need to be thinking about and talking about, be using, all right? So that's the idea for the NLP resource. And now I've got another topic to switch on you, okay? That topic is Sanskrit, this ancient 6,000-year-old language. So Sanskrit is cool to me just because, you know, I'm ethnically Indian, even though I was born in America. Sanskrit is like the language of my ancestors and it's the language of many people who are here right now, the ancient language that we have forgotten over 6,000 years. Um, it's a very beautiful language. It's been forgotten over the years. There's not much data, which we're gonna find. We're gonna look at some Sanskrit data in a second, but you know, there are three properties of Sanskrit that I wanna talk about that make it really interesting as a language for natural language processing. The first thing that makes it really interesting is this idea that the word order doesn't matter. Just think about that for a second. You can have words in different orders and it could still mean the same thing. In fact, there's a type of poetry in Sanskrit where you can read the whole thing forwards and it's gonna tell one story, like say the story of Krishna, one of the gods. But if you read it backwards, it's gonna tell an entirely different story of a different god or person, like say Rama. And that's a specific style that you can do in Sanskrit. You can't do that in English. You can't do that in many languages. And there's one, uh, one third property of Sanskrit that is really important to talk about from a language processing perspective. And that is that words are represented as properties instead of as objects. So in Sanskrit, a tree wouldn't be like a noun, like that is a tree. It would be more like that is a tallish figure. It's like, it's more of a description of it than the actual physical manifestation of it. And that's because it's a relatively spiritual language that was generally used to describe matters of, you know, spirituality and meditation and transcendental states. So it's a very flowery descriptive language and there's a lot of complexity there. But the point is that because you can write language in two different directions and because the word order doesn't matter and because there are these very fundamentally different syntactic properties of Sanskrit as opposed to English, we have to fundamentally reconsider what the path to superintelligence looks like. GPT-3 was trained on, on English data from Reddit and English works in a certain way and GPT-3 is great, but imagine interpolating GPT's knowledge base with Sanskrit, with this idea of attending to the not just the front to the back, but back to the forward, right? So there's different attention mechanisms in natural language processing. You know, we process data from left to right and back to forward. But what if ideas are encoded backwards to forwards as well? That opens up a whole new avenue for natural language processing and text and language modeling, right? So I just wanted to briefly talk about that. Um, and so now what I'd like to do is I would like us to look at some Sanskrit language models. So let's briefly go back uh, to, to the browser. And we're going to look at some Sanskrit language models. I know some people had some issues submitting the first answers. Don't worry. I'm going to be lenient. There will always be a winner in these weekly games. All right. So just, even if you missed that one, keep answering. It's the one with the highest score. You don't necessarily have to answer all three. All right, guys, I'm listening to you. So, um, by the way, uh, congratulations. <laughs> Good job. Okay. So what do we want to talk about here? Well, I want to talk about language models. So let's go to GitHub. Let's go to GitHub. Let's type in, um, you know, let's, this was a really interesting repository that I liked 
basically this guy started with raw Sanskrit text from Jeet. He started with some raw Sanskrit text and you can see that Sanskrit text right here. It's in English characters, uh, but it's raw Sanskrit text. And guys, honestly, GitHub is the best place to find Sanskrit data. I have been looking for Sanskrit data all over the web and I have not found a better place for pre-processed, fully formatted, machine learning ready data than on GitHub. So absolutely check out GitHub for that. But you know, if we wanted to look for Sanskrit data, Kaggle, there's this Sanskrit Wikipedia articles that Gaurav made. Uh, Gaurav made 24,000 Wikipedia articles completely in Sanskrit. So there's no English there. But, um, you know, Suntran is the library that we used um, in this because they've got the Bhagavad Gita in Sanskrit and in English. They've got the Holy Bible in English and in Sanskrit. And they have this file called Govinda, which I don't think it's a, I'm not sure what it is. I, I think it's maybe the Rig Veda, one of the Vedic documents, but they've got English and uh, Sanskrit translations for us, uh, this team of authors, which originally got it from this other guy, Nemzi. So it's just a chain of people uh, building on each other's code. That's how software works. But Sentran is one library. Uh, this word embedding library, I wanted to actually run in Colab so we can you know, run it together. So that's what we're gonna do very briefly uh, is we're gonna download this word embedding. We're gonna go to Colab. We're gonna open up a new notebook in Colab. Hold on, let's open up a new notebook in Colab. And we're going to uh, run some exploratory data analysis on some Sanskrit characters, you know, because we saw that Keras model and uh, let's see, word embedding Python notebook. There it is. I've already uploaded it here. It's going to load up, you know, sometimes Colab can be very, you know, a GPU hog, even though it's in the browser, you know, you don't have to deal with dependencies. Um, it's still, you know, quite taxing to have a compiler as a tab in your browser. Um, so, so what happened here? So we start with the data, right? Of course, pandas is going to be for data pre-processing. Um, I had to install, this was me right here. I just like added this pip install pipe fast text, uh, for data pre-processing. That was not in the original uh, repository, but you know, formatting it for Colab, that is something we want to do. So let's just like, uh, run through this code, just break by break. So we start by importing pandas. Uh, we have our library here. We read our data.txt. Um, and then you can see, you give it some initial words like Arjuna, Bhima, Vasudeva. These are Sanskrit words, Yudhish, Yudhishthara, Bhima, Arjuna, Vasudeva. And it's gonna find the similarity between those words and the pre-trained models. So this guy actually created word uh, vectors of these word representations. And you know, it would be truly insane for us to train a language model on what deep learning requires during this live stream because A, it wouldn't work, it takes too long. And B, it would probably crash everything um, unless we train it in the cloud. So the point is that what this, what this, what this model does, this WV model, is it takes these Sanskrit words from that data.txt file and it creates a set of vector representations of those words. Now, what are vector representations? Uh, if you search word 2 vec Siraj on YouTube, so many videos I have on word 2 vec by now, back when it was new and cool, but uh, word 2 vec basically turns words into these essentially variables in this word space where you can then perform operations that doesn't, it, it doesn't seem natural, but you can perform operations on word like in Sanskrit, maybe something specific would be like um, Govinda plus uh, divinity equals Krishna because Krishna is a is a Govinda like cow herder. He's also divine in the te sacred texts. So then Govinda plus that would equal Krishna. And so you know that's how we would think about it. But there's actually a computational way of defining that with vectors, and that's how it's done with word to vec. So once we have that initial set of vectors, then we would give it to another pre-trained model like say Transformer XL or any of the dozens of models that we looked at previously. Um, and then we would go look in that. But now I'm going to take another break to see if you're still paying attention um, to ask you a more simple question. So I know the previous question was a little harder, so I know. So we're going to go a little easier this time, all right? So the question now, it's a multiple choice question, all right? The question now is, which of the following is not an application of language models? We've just talked about language models so much, guys. But which of these is not an application of language models? Is it A, inverse kinematics, B, sentiment analysis, 
C, text generation, or D, part of speech tagging. Think about that. Which of these is not an application of language models? And let me answer questions while we talk about this. Um, can such a model like GPT-3 work on devices like cell phones? Um, great, great question. No, it's way too big. You would need a slim model. And TF Lite comes to mind, the model for running machine learning inference on mobile devices. So it creates these smaller binaries or these converter files to, to convert these large uh, pre-trained model files into mobile ready. And it doesn't matter if it's trained with Keras, with whatever, you can use this other library called Onyx, O-N-N-Y-X, O N Y X to transfer or train or, you know, convert a model type to a mobile ready format. That's one way. Another way is to use an API. So you upload the model to the cloud and you're just calling it via HTTP get set requests, right? That's always an easy way to do that. Um, Muhammad Reza says my mother tongue Persian is also based on Sanskrit. Oh, I did not know that. That's amazing and has plenty of similar properties. That's amazing. I, you know, guys, there's so many beautiful languages in the world. I wish I could talk about Arabic. My own name is uh, Asiraj, is based on Arabic. Um, my dad is Muslim. My mom is Hindu. So I grew up very confused. Um, I want an app that will help me learn about the legends in Sanskrit. So believe it or not, Martin, I actually found that on GitHub. I mean, let's, 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 um, let's remind me to look through that right after this question. I'm gonna go through some amazing Sanskrit uh, examples for you. One more question before we continue here. It seems like people are pretty sure what the answer is for this one. But one more question is that is, how do you integrate ML models with UI UX design for apps and websites? Such a wonderful question, Iron Man. It's an honor. I'm, I'm honored that you're here, Tony Stark. I love you. I've been versing you in Fortnite and it's great that you join me in this game. So you're inter-game traveling. Um, the best way, I have the perfect examples for you. Uh, if you search Watch Me Build Siraj on YouTube, I literally have reposit starter repositories for you that integrate ML in a bunch of different application specific domains like marketing, finance, um, you know, education, a bunch of them. Um, and so go through those and you're definitely gonna find some, all right? So let's now answer the question here, all right? So it seems like somebody changed their answer um, I'm going to finish and reveal in three, two, one, finish and reveal. The answer was a inverse kinematics. Inverse kinematics is a strategy from robotics where we are trying to find the ideal XYZ coordinate of say an end effector for an arm in XYZ space. And then we have to compute how all of the other limbs in our arm, all the other degrees of freedom for as many as we have, where, where all they have to be in XYZ coordinate space. And the way to do that is to use calculus, which tells us which direction, you know, the laws of motion, which direction all of these components need to be in order to get to where we need to be. And so inverse kinematics is the study of how calculus is used. There are terms like the Jacobian, et cetera. Um, definitely look up inverse, I actually have a video on that too. Again, video on everything, inverse kinematics, Raj. All right, so glad that we got done with that. Good job, guys. We have one more question. All right, but before we get to that one more question, um, I want to uh, go through some Sanskrit repository because someone was talking about, you know, what what should I be looking at um, in terms of a project to get started with uh, Sanskrit and, you know, what, what could we be doing? I'll also be reciting some Sanskrit at the very end. So stay tuned for that. You know how that goes. So let's just like, guys, what we wanna be, we wanna be GitHub explorers. We essentially want to be like Indiana Jones diving through GitHub to look at what's been done because so many people have so kindly open sourced their work that they've, you know, done before. And so a great starting point for data science specifically for machine learning is just, just look at Jupyter Notebooks or Python because those generally have uh, the projects with the most resources that we're going to need that's going to take the least amount of work to just get started so this guy's got um you know the gita decoded in um a csv format ready for us but the problem is that the ipython notebook in this as you can see it's probably not going to be filled like it's got some initial data preprocessing, but look that's it that's that's where it ends like there's nothing more and so look at that so that's a problem so they're not all going to be good but we're definitely going to find some really good ones um, as we go through these. And so um, 
as we go through those, you know, different things that we can think about. Um, but, you know, somebody was asking about what the cutting edge of language models look like. Um, and I want to talk about that. I also briefly, I just glanced at a question that I want to answer as well. Can you please explain this? The first common step in any data analysis is exploratory data analysis, correct? How does EDA actually help in building the actual model? Okay, EDA does not actually help in building the model. EDA is basically, if you go to Kaggle.com and you look at any of the starter repositories for any of the top competitions, I think those that's the best way to see how EDA is actually useful. It's not useful in building the model. It's useful in deciding what parts of the input data are going to be the most relevant, you know, data pre-processing essentially. What features are going to be relevant, you know, and by visualizing the correlations between features using statistical measures of center, like mean, median, mode, um, you know, uh, standard deviation, all of those are going to give us initial clues as to what features are going to be the most relevant. Now, is that always necessary? No, especially in the case of deep learning, where that's not data pre-processing is not as relevant, but it's also useful for us to know what we should be building a model around, right? So like, you know, what is the objective that we've defined? Maybe it's finding the next likely city for a, a certain crime to occur, given a list of cities in the past, you know, learning about the say waste management data of those cities, it could be useful for a different objective, but it's not going to be useful for crime prediction. And so exploratory data analysis will help us find out what parts of the data are going to be relevant. What's really sticking out. What's the anomaly. And so in a lot of ways, it's just for us, right? How do we define the objective? And so, um, that's the idea for that. And there's one more thing I want to show you. And that is this idea, this one learning resource that I really love. And that is the illustrated reformer. So I think that this is the most modern, uh, tutorial that you can find on the entire internet when it comes to, uh, transform like natural language processing and modern, uh, NLP techniques. It's called the illustrated reformer. So Jay Alamar, you know, he had this illustrated transformer, uh, uh, article, which I'm sure you've read. And if you haven't, you should check that out. But the reformer is the latest, it's the latest iteration of the transformer. And basically the, the, the basic idea of the reformer was to say that, you know, we have these language models. How do we improve on them? How do we improve on the transformer model? And so, you know, they, they go through a lot of different problems here, like attention computation, large numbers of layers, all of this stuff is, you know, non-trivial stuff. It's, it's, you know, you're going through locality, sensitive hashing, all this stuff. But, you know, to simplify it a little bit, there's a, you know, one thing that I want to just briefly show you, and that is the idea of attention and, and why it's so important. So, you know, normally, you know, we have a neural network and I'm just going to draw a neural network right here. And you've got data flowing through all of the nodes in the network, all the weight matrices. And that's, that's a neural network essentially, right? So what, what, are the, hold on, it's gonna, it's gonna pause and then it's gonna go. Okay. What is, what kind of neural network is this? Well, this is a feed forward neural network because data is moving from one direction to the next, from the input to the output, input to output. That's a feed forward neural network. But when we have sequences of data, not only do we feed the network, the, uh, every data point, we also feed it whatever's being computed in the hidden state. So everything that's being computed right here, that is the input for the every next iteration in the training process. But the thing of the thing about these hidden states are that they're really big. They can get really big for long sequences of text. So how do we improve on that? Well, instead of storing those hidden states and using those hidden states as input every iteration, that process is called recurrence because we, there's a recur, recursive feature happening Instead of doing that, what if instead in this neural network, right? In this neural network, instead of doing that, we instead said, we instead said embedded in each of these nodes, there's this thing called attention, which I'm going to label as a, and that replaces the idea of recurrence. We don't have to re, you know, take that hidden state and use this input in the next iteration. We don't have to do that. Why? Why don't we have to do that? Because it is very big, it, you know, 
One way to think about attention is that attention is a mechanism. It is a gradient based mechanism that tells us the direction that we should be learning in specifically, you know, all of this stuff, all of machine learning, all of deep learning is one way to think about it is there are a series of checkpoints, gradient based checkpoints, you know, where we have an entire model that is differentiable. That is, we can find the direction that some data is moving in. What is, where does, where does the data flow? Right. And so attention is essentially adding a new series of checkpoints, gradient based checkpoints uh, to the model, as opposed to just updating the hidden states. We're also updating these new checkpoints called attention mechanisms. And, you know, in the, in the case of the reformer, it's a multi headed attention um, matrix. And what it does is it attends to or it finds the parts of the input data that are the most relevant. And as opposed to the hidden state, which is a huge chunk of the input data compressed, attention only looks at the relevant parts of the hidden data. So it's kind of like a pointer. And as it's training, it's like, what part of the Siraj, hello, what, what part is the most relevant as it's looking through all the probability values? And, and so that's what the attention mechanism does. It's, it's, it's different. It's using gradient based differentiation to define what parts of the input data are the most relevant. And that, that process, as opposed to storing the whole hidden state, is much more memory efficient and time efficient. So the reformer, the latest iteration of the transformer, the latest iteration of language models, we can think of the reformer as, is a gradient-based, attention-based encoder-decoder model that does not use recurrence. It is much more time and space efficient. So time and space complexity is much more efficient. Now, all of that, I just told you so that you can help answer this next question, the last question, okay? So let's talk about the last question here. The last question is, it's going to be a simple multiple choice question. Why is attention all you need? All you need is attention, why? Is it A, because it's not, you also need recurrence. Is it B, because it increases time complexity? Is it C, because it enables more parallel processing? Or is it D, because it's irrelevant? Why do we use attention in language models? Why has attention caused an absolute explosion? Remember the explosion we talked about in the past two years of language models using deep learning for all of those natural language tasks that we talked about, language generation, text class, why? Why is attention all you need? And while you answer that, I have two questions I'm gonna answer from the audience, ready? Question one is, what do you think when GANs would be used in educational uh, MOOCs? You talked about this in podcast with Vinod Kosla. That's right. Um, Vinod's been thinking about this. Um, what do I think about that? I think that that's the future. You know, honestly, if I was, if my definition of success was like a startup where I was a CEO and I had, you know, 500 people that I was managing, I'd probably do something like that. Like a, just generate an entire course end to end using deep learning. The avatar, the the text, like this whole live stream could be generated with a deep fake. You know, the questions could be generated. The curriculum could be generated. Use, you know, in, use GitHub as a data repository. So everything can is that can be automated will be automated, including my own job. And that's fine. Um, what's going to be left? Empathy. So just focus on empathy. Focus on adaptability, as Yuval Harar Noah Harari says in his book, um, Sapiens Homo Deus. Read those two books absolutely to be prepared for the future because everything that can be automated will be automated. Don't go to medical school right now because I promise you in 8 to 12 years, most of medicine is going to be automated. My friend John is a doctor. We've talked about this extensively law, medicine, everything is going to be automated in the next decade. So you need to just focus on machine learning, thinking about things from a data literate perspective, being adaptable in your focus, being adaptable, right? You want to be like water, be like Bruce Lee. You can be a good at this, good at that. It doesn't matter. Don't stay too, you know, don't stay too attached to some library or some programming language. Be free, be like water, be into computer graphics, be into machine learning, be into blockchain. You can do anything. You got to believe in yourself. All right. Cause I definitely believe in myself. So one more question, uh, before we answer this question and we see who's the winner of this live stream. All right. One more question is just a follow up. So is EDA for our interpretations? There is no way that EDA actually helps you intelligently selects some models to start with, right? Um, 
Not necessarily. You know, one way to think about how you intelligently select a model is ensemble learning, right? So one of the easiest ways to think about ensemble learning where you have a collection of models and then you have some kind of meta learning algorithm that decides not just what the best hyperparameters are, but what the best model to use is would be a random forest where you have a collection of trees that are being used to store data um, for some data prediction. And there's a forest of those trees because there are a collection of them. And then you are trying to learn which of those models is gonna be the best. And so that is not necessarily exploratory data analysis. That is again, uh, a pre-processing step, which is model selection before model training. But listen, that all that is to say that exploratory data analysis, it's not as fun. It's not as mathy as the rest. It's not as valuable for me to talk about. I've, I've learned from these live streams as the math part, but it's still super useful and you'll still get a lot of brownie points on Kaggle uh, for using those in your, in your, uh, repositories. All right. Uh, well, I got to answer one more question. Rohan asks uh, any good projects to build using GANs. Okay. Let me, let me give you three right now. All right. Freestyling three GAN projects. Free, uh, number one is create an avatar that speaks something that you hear with audio. So audio to video generation, pick your favorite character and use it as your avatar. The second one is text generation. You know, can you rebuild something using a GAN? And the third one is Again, for um, image generation for Pokemon. Let's see if you can make all new types of Pokemon using GANs, all right? So now let's finish and reveal and let's see who answered which question correctly. Here we go. Finish and reveal. The answer was because it enables more parallel processing. I'm so glad to see that most of you guys got that correctly. That is what I like to see. Okay. It enables more parallel processing because you don't need recurrence. You know, it reduces time complexity and it enables parallel processing because precisely because it reduces time and space complexity and that allows more parallel computations. Okay. So language models, they are the, uh, they are the story of 2020. I truly believe that language models are the story of 2020. I am now going to reveal the winner, but before I reveal the winner, I want to say one more thing here, and that is that knowledge and action are inextricably connected. I truly believe that. And language models act as a knowledge base, right? They act as a knowledge base, but what are its actions? Its actions, it needs a set of controls, right? And that, those set of controls up, down, left, right, in some continuous or discrete action space could be in a simulation, like a game, or it could be in the real world. And when the, the important thing to think about when we're thinking about language models is that it's essentially intent generation. It's able to generate an intent, like what it wants to do. And then from that intent, it can have controls. So language models are a crucial part. I truly believe of artificial general intelligence. They will be, we should absolutely think about them. Uh, we should, there's so many easy ways to get started with language models using that hugging face repository I showed you on GitHub. And we should think about ways to combine language models with a set of controls like reinforcement learning to give them more potential, more capabilities and experiment in that way. Because I think that's a really fun experiment. That's a really fun project. It's something that I would do. Let's now see who won this game, who won $500. I'm going to end the session. I'm going to view the results and I will now look at who answered all of this and who got it all correctly. All right. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Who got them all? Well, nobody got them all, unfortunately, but um, this the runner-up, who is now going to be the winner, who was closest to getting them all, was Nikola Toshev. Nikola, Nikola. Congratulations, Nikola. I want everybody to congratulate Nikola in the chat right now. Uh, I am Nikola wins $500 in cryptocurrency, Bitcoin or Ethereum. Nikola, email me hello at Roger Vol within the next 24 hours, and I will send it to you within the next 24 hours. Congratulations, everybody. Congratulate Nikola. I will now freestyle and sing a song for Nikola, and I'm also going to recite some Sanskrit because this is a this is a lecture on NLP and Sanskrit. It's a it's a game show on on both of those things. All right, so. This is a quote from the Bhagavad Gita, my favorite book in Sanskrit. Um, let's put, let's throw that up there. Okay, let's throw that up there. And 
basically what this says in Sanskrit is it says from anger, complete delusion arises and from delusion, bewilderment of memory. When memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. And when intelligence is lost, one falls down again into the material pool. What a badass line that is. So I'm going to use that as a chorus for this freestyle as I rap for Nicola. Here we go. Samoha, Samohat Smruti Vibramaha, Smruti Pramshat Buddhi Nasho, Buddhi Nashat Pranashati, Nikola, making all my electricity fly. I'm a Tesla. I see you in my mind. You got my Mathematica, every single Mathematica. Uh. I got my language model. It's got the Markov property. Nikola did it. Can't you see he did one, two, three? Bigram, trigram, anemone under the sea. You see it when you beat. Krodhat pavati samoha, samohat smruti vibramaha, smruti pramshat buddhi nasho, buddhi nashat pranashati. Congratulations, Nicola. I'm a huge fan of what you've done here. You have definitely inspired us by winning this competition. Thank you everybody for being here. I'm not going to end the stream yet. I have to plug this in. Hold on. Thank you everybody for being here. I love you. And uh, I want you to study natural language processing. Okay, I don't want you to you know, get bored with it. I want you to always be studying it. And uh, thank you for being here. I love you guys. Um, what else do I want to say to you? I want to say uh, subscribe if you like the video. Also, this video was sponsored by Classpert. Classpert uh, sponsored this video. Thank you, Classpert. Classpert is this free online course website that has a collection of courses like Udacity, Coursera, you know, Udemy, any kind of course you want. Uh, it's got it listed for free. So it's a great learning resource. I've got a link for Classport, Classpert for you in the video description. Definitely check out Classpert. All right, guys. So Classpert is the name of the sponsor for this video. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Shout out to Classpert um, and shout out to everybody. I love you guys. All right. Peace. And I'll see you next week.